Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webcast. My name is Beata Drogovic. Thanks for joining us today. As mentioned, my name is Beata Drogovic. I'm the founder of Freedom Chair Financial. We are an independent wealth management firm located in Boston, uh, but we are a national firm working with clients in multiple states in the US. We have a strong foundation in comprehensive financial planning, and we also work with professionals in the biotech and tech sectors extensively, which allows us to consult on equity compensation strategies. And we do work with clients on a long-term financial planning and investment management basis. With that said, today we will focus on the following. We will start reviewing the latest compensation trends in the biotech life science sector. We will review the most common equity grants. And then we will focus on equity compensation from the perspective of transition and for negotiating for a new offer. And we will finalize, uh, uh, close out our webinar reviewing your equity compensation from the standpoint of your financial plan. So let's start. Life sciences have been experiencing volatility across the board in general, as, as capital markets have. The last many comp years of compensation trends actually reflect that. The biotech sector index was at its highest last uh, July, last September, September of 2021. Depending on the day that you are looking at, looking at it, it's been down ever since the index, the biotech index has been down approximately 20%, year to date around 14. The, as for the pharma index, if you are looking at uh, index positions for, for a pharma sector, the height was back in July 2015, and it really still hasn't recovered ever since. It's down 30% ever since. So the life science sector for the last two years has faced pressure caused by the pandemic and the unprecedented demand for talent. I honestly believe that I've been talking about the unprecedented demand for talent in the life science sector for the last decade, not for the last two years, but there is, but is, there is no slowing down. It's especially as the industry has been front and center when it comes to movement, especially in the last two years. And according to Aon's study, 71% of life science companies plan to increase their workforce in the next few years, and one third of them by at least 15%. There is also voluntary turnover, and according to AEONS, it is approximately around 18%. So life science companies are you know, facing the challenge, how do they attract and retain, how do they, how do they attract talented employees and how do they retain them? And we are looking at a multi a faceted uh, response here. First of all, obviously, evolving compensation trends are the answer. The starting salaries of many key positions are at a market rate high. Uh, use of sign-on bonuses are as strong as ever, and companies need to focus on long-tenured employees as well and make them happy, obviously. It is more and more apparent that firms are not able to tackle um, attraction and retention with merit simply. They do need to focus on the entire employee value proposition. They need to focus on employee center strategies and well-being. Let that be targeted recharge days, more days, day offs around the summertime or, or around holidays. Flexibility is a word that we see a lot. A hybrid workplace. And most importantly, also, career advancement seems to be important across all generations. And what we are going to talk about today and our focus is, is really about what we've been seeing is the increasing use of equity. It's always been a an, an very important part of compensation packages at life science companies, biotech. Um, it is an integral part of the total re rewards package, but some of the new trends that we've been seeing is one of them is faster vesting periods and also making targets more, uh, make, make uh, grants more targeted. We also seeing use of full value shares and many life science, more increased use of full value shares. And many life science companies are introducing restricted stock units earlier. And lastly, uh, but not least equity choice. So at the commercial stage, um, it is being considered 
if, you know, if for companies to offer equity choice is becoming a differentiation method, which is I find very interesting and I'm smiling as 15 years ago, this was probably one of my, the number one questions I used to receive from my clients from this sector is which one should I choose, RSUs or options? And then those completely disappeared with trends as we've seen either or. And now the option for you to choose is coming back seemingly. So let's review the most common grants, um, stock options, non-qualified and qualified stock options. Restricted stock units and restricted stock, we will talk about those as well as performance shares. And let's start with options. So what are options? So a stock option grant gives you the right to buy a company's stock at a certain price. After your stock option vests, you have the option to exercise the option at the grant price. For that to happen and, to be, and for it to be worthwhile, the market price of the stock has to be higher than the grant price. This is what we call when the, your option is in the money. And to exercise your options, you buy the stock at the grant price and pay taxes on the spread. So the spread is the difference with, with the, with, between the market price and the grant price. There are two different kind of options, non-qualified options and incentive stock options. The difference between the two are, are basically taxation. With non-qualified options, there is no holding period required. If your options are in the money, they can be exercised as soon as they vest. The spread will be taxed as ordinary in income. If you decide to exercise and sell, there are no further tax implications. However, if you do decide to exercise and hold the stock, a long-term capital gain taxes or loss will apply if you sell after a one-year holding period. As it comes to incentive stock options, ISOs, uh, they offer, offer preferential tax treatment. So no ordinary income tax is due when you exercise. But the, but the difference between the market price as a, as a, and the grant price, which is the, it's a, we call a bargain element, it's a tax preference item for AMT purposes. And in order for you to have this preferential tax treatment, you must hold the stock for two years from exercise and one year from uh, grant date. If you sell uh, your shares early, that's what we call a disqualifying uh, disposition, and your options become non-qualified and taxes will be due again ordinary income. Okay, um, so let's go to the next. Restricted stock units and restri restricted uh, stock. And th 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 there's, there's a difference between the two. RSUs, restricted stock units, are much more popular. That's what you see most of the time. They are basically both uh, a, a, a transfer of company stock from an employer to an employee. When RSUs vest, uh, the value of the grants is taxed as ordinary income. Therefore, knowing your vesting schedule, you can actually have a really good estimate of your future income. How much you will pay in ordinary income taxes that will depend on the shares the amount of shares that vest times uh, the market price of the stock. So when restricted stock is granted, shares are issued up front at grant, but you do not own them outright until the restriction lapse at vesting. You do have dividend rights with restricted stock. And also restricted stock is also at best its ordinary income as RSUs. And in order to in potentially, potentially to reduce um, your tax liability, there is a strategy you can use here, and that is a Section 83B election that is only available for uh, restricted stock. This, this is why you need to know. I always recommend you review whether you, you, are, you were granted restricted stock. So in this case, you pay uh, taxes on the value of the stock at grant and not at exercise. So the major advantage here can be that you pay lower taxes when the stock price is lower at grant than when at vesting. And you can also start the holding period for long-term capital gains earlier. Obviously, there is, um, you know, obviously there, there can be issues here if the company's stock price is much lower at vesting. And that, that's the risk here. And then at grant, because at that case, you can't recover the taxes you paid in advance. As it comes to performance shares, they become very popular uh, form of equity, equity compensation these last few years. 
This has a lot to do with the volatility of the options, obviously. Performance shares are, again, much more sure way of um, receiving equity. So they are usually not granted upfront, but rather as part of a long-term incentive plan. Performance shares are typically tied to also meeting a specific future goal, such as a profit target, earnings. Grants can be structured as performance stock awards, which are very similar to restricted stock, or performance stock units, which are similar to RSUs. And these PSUs, they have a value added at vesting. It gets paid in stock or cash or in a combination of two. And these both PSAs and PSUs can be very beneficial and they more beneficial than regular restricted stock as they can offer more than 100% target pay if the company exceeds its performance tar- target. So I see this uh, many times. We'll give you an example. Let's assume instead of um, 5,000 shares that would vest, you receive 7,500 shares at a higher market price. So those are the three that we wanted to talk about. I do want to mention, I see a lot employee stock purchase plans lately. That's not an employer offered grant. It is just your uh, ability to buy a company stock at a discount. So we will not really cover that today, but I wanted to mention that, that, that it's out there and I see it increasingly common. And I get a question on employee stock purchase plans. One question I get the most is, Should I sign up? And at what percent? Well, it all depends on multiple things, your cash flow and so on. But most importantly, it depends on your concentration in the stock. So make that decision whether you should also buy company stock through an ESPP program if it's offered based on the fact that, you know, what what, what amount of grant you are getting as it is from your company. Is it worthwhile to keep buying company stock or should you just save into a diversified portfolio? So as we are mentioning that restricted stock units becoming more popular, more popular than options, especially in the last decade, I thought it would be important for us to take a look at when would you choose restricted stock units and when would you choose options, especially as we mentioned that equity choice is becoming more available again. Let's, Let's review. So when would you choose, and this is not a, this is a limited list. There can be many other options, other reasons why you choose one or the other. But I thought it's important. So for example, if you have a low uh, risk tolerance and you need to earmark dollars proceeds uh, for short or intermediate goals, then in both of those cases, restricted stock units, RSUs are much more beneficial because as soon as the stock vests, you, you are surely, no matter what is the market value of the uh, market share price, uh, what is the share price of the stock, you will receive the benefit. You will receive the stock and you can immediately sell the day it vests. If you already have a concentrated position in the stock, again, for the same reason, it can be a good opportunity for you to uh, choose RSUs because you can just sell and diversify. If you are neutral or bearish on the stock, I would probably go with RSUs. Options have a tremendous upside potential, but you need to have your company stock to increase at a significant rate in order for you to have it worthwhile. And also another option can be, depending on where you are with your your goals, with your financial independence or retirement, let's assume you have a four-year time frame and you are retiring. If you choose RSUs, they will most probably majority of them will vest in the next three to four years if you plan to stay with the company and you are surely receiving a grant. As it comes to options, it's exactly the opposite. If you have a high tolerance um, risk, you can take the risk, you have the time to wait, then I would recommend options. Options have a very um, high leverage and you have a very high potential for, um, for appreciation. But the company's stock, you have to be bullish on the stock in order for that to have happen. You probably have sufficient cash flow if you choose options and you don't really need, you don't want to count on this company grant in the near term and you can just let it appreciate. You can wait out for the company's stock to increase in value enough that it's worthwhile for you to exercise the options 
Again, if you have a diversified portfolio, it can be a, a good option, as, as we talked about that, um, versus RSUs. And again, if you have a longer time frame, as I mentioned, and, and time for, for you to be worthwhile for, for exercise options is not an, not an issue. Those I would recommend. And again, here, I would like to stop because I do get the questions, as I mentioned, which one should I choose? You know, one simple answer is a balance. But one other way you can also look at it, you need to understand what amount of proceeds, if you have, you need to understand your financial goals. Do you need in the short, uh, intermediate term to fund any kind of goal? Let that be an, any kind of purchase, a down payment for a second home. i just give you an example. And you also need to know what is that that you need to earmark for long-term appreciation, let's say your retirement. So once you know those numbers, it's it's a bit more uh, easier to choose what percentage you can get, you would like to choose for RSUs and what for options. So let's switch gears, and as I mentioned, let's talk about a little bit about transition. Again, this is an industry where where the unprecedented demand for talent is is a line that I hear all the time, probably in every article that I read. And I see it with clients as well. There is a continuous movement um, in the industry. So what do you do when you know potentially, let's assume you actually know that you are leaving and you will negotiate for a new offer. You want to get organized. That's the first step. You want to be able to get organized. And the first step is that you know your current benefits. You understand your current company's rules, what you are taking with you, what you are leaving behind. So first of all, you take a, Look at your vested benefits, 401k plan and match. What do you have right now? Your vested options, your vested RSUs, any other incentives. And very importantly, you look at your documents. I always recommend you actually look at this at higher and organize your grant documents, severance, stock plan summary. So you understand what is that that you have, what, what kind of options you have when you leave, how many days you have to exercise your vested options, and so on. That's just giving you an example. So also, you need to take an inventory of your non-vested benefits. This is a very important, both of them are, but, but also on non-vested benefits, such as unvested RSUs and options, or your current long-term incentive plan. They are an important base for negotiating uh, for new equity with the new company you are transitioning to. And know what is negotiable. Um, I get this question, uh, this question a lot as well when my clients are going to, for a new job and they are negotiating their offer package. Offer, uh, Yes, their offer package. First of all, human resources is expecting you to negotiate. Um, base salary, sign-on bonus, these can be negotiable. Obviously, you need to know, do I need, do I have a good cash flow? Do I need to earmark? Is it better if I have a better cash flow right now? Is that more important? That's how you negotiate for that. Vesting schedule for new grants. That is probably one of the uh, area you can negotiate upfront. The type and size of a grant. That's what you need to also look at. Is that important for you as we talked about that, right? And then the severance package. Um, at, it's the most easy to negotiate at higher. And this is the time potentially, obviously, depending on also the role you are applying for. That will also depend on how much you can negotiate. But for example, with severance package, you are able to negotiate accelerated vesting potentially, as giving you an example again. What I would recommend that you pick two of these and, and try to pick the two most important and get back to HR with, with those. Usually you will, you will receive you will, see, you will receive a pretty positive response on that. All right. So negotiate your new offer whenever possible. So let's review once more. Find out, first and most, just consider your own financial situation and financial goals, as I mentioned to you. Use current benefits and incentives as the base for negotiations. As we just reviewed it, consider the forfeit value of your current unvested options and RSUs. I just want to stop at this one, really. This is very important. I I'm always able to tell clients the forfeit value of, of their options and RSUs that they leave behind. Why that's important? Because it's a very important base for equity that you're negotiating at a new company. You know what is the, and also long-term incentive plans. You know what is that you are receiving currently on an ongoing basis. 
and that should help. Obviously, when you're leaving from pharma to smaller biotech, you will not, you are, we are not comparing apples to apples, but the forfeit value of your invested grants always gives you also a really good understanding of what, uh, what you can negotiate for. And again, decide on equity compensation structure, gather as much information about the company, consider taxes and cons uh, con consult a financial advisor, tax accountant, employment attorney before you make the transition and during the transition. So let's close out our webcast by talking a little bit about financial planning and how you should be thinking about your equity and your financial plan. So what I would always suggest that rather than letting your equity compensation drive your financial circumstances, I would flip that planning on its head and first define your life goals, such as educating your children, retirement, financial planning. And based on that, make decisions about your equity grants. Then let those goals rather drive your stock option or restricted stock decisions. Again, as we reviewed this, work with professionals. Uh, professionals can help you for a multi-year strategy, tax projection for your various grants. And always understand how stock volatility can alter the plan. I've seen this in the last six months. I've seen this in the last five years. Make sure that you don't spend the money that you don't have yet. Unfortunately, uh, biotech, pharma sector can be very volatile. And make sure that that's why it's important that first evaluate what financial goals you have. And according to that, knowing your risk tolerance time frame you choose uh, your equity compensation and you make your equity compensation decisions. All right, and, and one last slide on looking at a holistic view on, on financial planning. And let's look at, really try to look at assets, liabilities and equities just a little bit differently in this case. So if I assume that your assets are your home, your company stock, your company stock options, and all other your diverse, diversified portfolios, assets you have, as well as your net employment capital. And, and this is why we ensure with disability our net employment capital. It's a crucial part for you to be able to keep save, saving for long-term goals. Let's assume those are your assets. And then let's separate as liabilities and equities your your goals, such as, first of all, you have to pay your mortgage off, you're planning potentially college education for your kids, you wanna buy a home, and you wanna um, also retire, be financially independent. So once you know what is it that you need to put aside for to achieve all of this, it will be much easier to figure out from your assets what is that that you need to earmark for that, right? And it will give you a much, this is what I've been saying all along, that if you go from this, flipped around direction, you will be able to uh, make much better decision around what should be, what, what kind of risk can you take with your equity compensation. Also, it will give you, it will show you what discretionary wealth you have. And most probably there's a really good chance if you are in the industry that that can happen, it can happen to many of you. And then you can potentially retire earlier. You can retire in, in a manner that you didn't think you could, or Many of you are charitable and you can realize your charitable intentions. So there's, there's, I would recommend that you look at it from this perspective. So with that said, let's just finalize and, and really with a quick final recap. Start by clarifying the financial goals that are aligned with your personal values. If you start with your personal values, it's very rarely you can make a bad decision. Assess, assess, assess your current financial wealth understand the various equity grants, understand tax implications, and then work with professionals. Strategize, create a plan that will help you negotiate as well. All right, so thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for listening today. I look forward to hearing from you. If you would like, if you have any questions on today's webcast or you wanted to schedule an introductory call with me, please visit our website, www.freedomtierfinancial.com. You can also simply just email us and also please follow us on social media. 
Thank you for listening and see you next time.